Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and I've got a couple of announcements first. Um, on uh, Tuesday, May 14th, we have an interesting workshop coming up. Um, most of us are animal lovers at the Wellness Forum and uh, I always call my cat a uh, two-year-old in a fur coat because that's sort of the way I think of him. So we have a lot of people asking us about the right health care for pets. What about vaccinations? What about food? When they get sick? What are some alternative things to do? Well, we have a veterinarian who is to animals what I am to people, and she's going to do a conference call for us on May 14th. We're very excited about this because we know, again, it's really interesting to a lot of people. And then the next Conversations with Dr. Pam is Tuesday, May 21st. Um, that's next week. And we're going to talk about fibromyalgia for the first few minutes. Um, what is it? What do you do about it? Um, there's some controversy over whether or not it's a real disease. We're going to talk about that. And then the rest of the time I'll answer any questions you want to ask me. So uh, Dr. Armady May is tonight. So you want to hurry up and give us a call if you want to get on that call. And then uh, Conversations with Dr. Pam on May 21st. All right, so last week I started this covering this fabulous book called Catastrophic Care by David Goldhill. I remembered to bring it for today's filming. And uh, I'm going to pick up where I left off. I think this book is so amazing. It should be required reading for anybody going into healthcare, whether you're going to be a hospital administrator or a doctor. So I'm um, just picking up again where we left off last time. Why have insurance companies, Medicare and Medicaid, not reduced costs? Well, the reason is they have no incentive to reduce costs and they actually have incentives to keep the costs high and even get them higher. The way to increase costs is, and premiums and profits is for people to get sicker and prices to rise. Now, a couple of things you may not know, and I guess I never thought about this before, but there is no budget for Medicare. They have an unlimited budget. There are no parameters. We spend whatever the bill is. So what would be the incentive of reducing costs? And we know this about everything. All programs have an incentive to expand themselves. And just to give you an idea of the expansion, Medicaid started in 1984 to pay for the delivery of children for poor women. Today it pays for more than 40% of births and 64% of all seniors in nursing homes are on Medicaid. And of course, with insurance companies, if you're making a percentage of the bill, you have an incentive for the bill to increase. So the bottom line is we've relied on the surrogates, that's what Gold, Gold Hill calls them, to control healthcare costs, and they just don't have any incentive to do it like consumers do. Most attempts that actually have attempted to reduce costs have backfired and created unforeseen problems. And one, and I find this so abominable, I've actually written about this before and it defies the imagination. Medicare decided to reduce reimbursements for chemotherapy in 1985. They cut the bill by 20%. It didn't make any difference. The total number of treatments ordered by doctors increased to compensate. So this resulted in millions of people being given too much treatment in order to keep doctors' incomes consistent. Now, there are a lot of doctors out there that would never participate in anything like this, but you know, there are some when you set up a system that's perverse enough that are gonna take advantage of it, and that's the way it is. Now there are some um, parallels, I think, between healthcare and airlines, for example. Airlines um, used to be highly regulated, and before they were deregulated, they weren't allowed to compete on price. So what they tried to do is to compete on comfort and food and entertainment. But after deregulation, guess what they started doing? Competing on price, because they found out that what, that's what consumers really, really care about. Now the exception is um, luxury. In first class, there's still premium for first class, and the reason is employers are paying for it, not employees, uh, not the direct consumer. And again, when you have that surrogate in the middle, somebody else paying the bill, there's an incentive to keep the price high. In a consumer-driven economy, when you're not all on the healthcare island and you're back here on the mainland, companies compete on price, service, and other health features, but healthcare isn't consumer-driven. On the island, doctors and hospitals don't lose patients if the wait is long, the service is bad, the food is terrible. They don't have to face the same discipline and market forces that other business on the mainland do, like you and I. When money is no object, it's easy to avoid the hard dis discussions, like how much does it cost and are there better alternatives? The third party payer is passive, as I've mentioned, if not aggressively helping to fuel the problem. And so is the hospital. It doesn't really have to consult with anybody in order to deliver care because it already knows what is, uh, what is and is not reimbursable. So it leads to a false sense of security we have that the surrogates are out there negotiating for us to get lower prices. That's just not true. 
Now, part of the problem in healthcare, and I've addressed this many times before, is the expanding definition of need. And when somebody else is paying for it, it's amazing what you can find that you need. For example, food and clothing are needs, but designer jeans and expensive restaurants aren't, but they could be if somebody else was paying the bill. Now, wouldn't that be nice? Healthcare should really mean that people get sick and medicine provides treatment and cure. But the reality today is a search for new treatments and then finding conditions that require them, like Viagra and erectile dysfunction. The key to success on the island is that the treatments require a prescription, a doctor's visit, they're deductible and reimbursable. And somebody should at least be asking the question, should we really be subsidizing male impotence and calling it a health issue, particularly when it's another foodborne illness? My statement, not Gold Hills, by the way. He, he addresses diet and lifestyle, but not in quite the same way that we do. Healthcare manages a growing number of conditions without curing them, which also increases the bill. There's no incentive to cure because payment is based on the number of visits, drugs, surgeries, and units of services rather than outcomes. So think about how the world would be if people drove their cars to repair shops and people paid for the repairs whether the shop made them or not. What would the incentive be to deliver quality service and to actually fix a car? We love to pick on drug companies, but they respond rationally to the perverse system of incentives by making Me Too drugs and treatments looking for disease. At least their costs are transparent, which is a whole lot more than you can say for hospitals and procedures. But only with healthcare does competition not reduce prices. No matter how many statin drugs are introduced, those that are still under patent remain high priced. Well, I'll stop right there, but I'll be back to you on Thursday to continue this very um, interesting series on catastrophic care. Have a great day. Pass this on to somebody who you think it would help, and I'll talk to you again on Thursday.